back with Miss Susie Castillo. And we left off when we were talking about pageantry and how do you feel the pageant uh, world, the pageant industry has evolved since you won in 2003? Yeah, I mean, I think for sure, I mean, we can't talk about the involvement of pageantry without talking about um, the fact that now it's not the prettiest girl, seemingly, that wins the pageant. I mean, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? Somebody who you think is the prettiest girl in the lineup, somebody else may not think is the prettiest one, right? So it's it's got to be about more. And I'm so happy to see that in today's pageant, they are actually highlighting all that, the more, you know, that I'm talking about. And it's just about, you know, what, what a girl's passions are, what, um, who she is as a human being, you know, it, can she, can she convey that authenticity on stage and, you know, the few moments on stage during the show when she gets to speak, um, do we learn more about her? Um, so it's just, it's nice to see that because, you know, it, it used to bother me back in the day, whenever I would do interviews, when people called it a beauty pageant, because I'm like, you know what? I have my college degree. I worked really hard. I'm not just a beauty, like I, okay, thank you. Like you think I'm pretty, you know, you think I'm beautiful. I, gracias. But that's not all that I am, you know? And so I, I hated it that I hated that it was called a beauty pageant. And I'm so happy that now, I mean, now they even call it they no longer even call it a pageant anymore. You know, they call it the Miss USA competition or the Miss Universe competition, you know? So I think that they're really trying to highlight more about what a girl is all about um, and not just beauty because all 51 of the girls that are competing are beautiful, you know? So it's like, what more do you have to offer? <laughs> Absolutely. And I think this year was, you know, the perfect year with Miss USA Chesley uh, being the first lawyer, I believe, to be crowned as Miss exactly. USA. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I Absolutely. love that. I love that. And speaking of Miss USA and the platform, you spoke to Chelsea recently, and you guys spoke about uh, wanting to utilize the Miss USA platform to help break stereotypes about the Latin and Black communities. So, can you share with yeah. us a bit about that conversation? For sure. Yeah. I mean, we had a great conversation because, and, and I shared with her how I, I remember the first question that I got asked after I was crowned. Um, I said that one of the things that I wanted to accomplish as Miss USA was hopefully breaking down some stereotypes of, of how people see Latinos, you know? And I said, when you watch television shows and movies, all you see are Latin folks being, um, you know, cleaning ladies or drug dealers or, you know, be, being bad people, right? Being gang members. And I said, yeah, that exists, but we could also be Miss USA's. We can also be other things, you know, and um, and not to put down people who, who work in housekeeping. My mom cleaned homes our entire life. That's how she raised us, you know, and, um, and, and she retired from a job where she was, how, you know, in the housekeeping department at a private high school in Massachusetts. So, and she was she was beloved at the school. From The students loved her, her boss, everybody loved my mom. And, you know, we're, I think the bottom line is that Latinos are hardworking people. You don't, you don't get up and leave your home country and go to a different country to go be lazy. You know, it's like, you're looking for a better life. You're looking for more opportunities for yourself and for other, for your family. And um, that's, that's the message that I wanted. That was the legacy that I wanted to leave behind as Miss USA. And I think you're doing you're doing just that. I mean, and I know that mm -hmm. another thing that I realized was that you created pageantology. I did. I want to, speaking about that, tell us about pageantology because that's an amazing initiative that you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, no, that was, it was seven years ago. I was having lunch with Miss USA 2004, Shandy Finnessy. Um, we, you know, it's funny. It's like all the Miss USA's, Miss Teen USA's, Miss Universes, everybody like trickles into LA after their years, <laughs> after being, you know, done with their year. And when I, um, I crowned Shandy, Miss USA 2004, um, and, you know, she moved into the title holder apartment in New York. I moved to LA, started my career. And then I moved to New York, back to New York to work at MTV. My first hosting job was, uh, I was a VJ on TRL on MTV. And 
when I moved back to New York, Shani was done with being Miss USA and then she moved to LA. So we kept crisscrossing coasts. And finally, when my contract was done at MTV and I moved back to LA, she and I became friends. And, um, and it was her idea. You know, she was like, we started talking about how we both prepared for Miss USA and we saw a lot of similarities. And we thought, you know, if, if this is something that worked for both of us and we both won Miss USA, um, maybe we could teach other girls. And so we created pageantology because we like the word ology at the end of the word pageant because it's kind of, for us, winning winning a pageant, can, there could be a science behind it, right? So we were like, oh, what would the science of pageantry be called? And we're like, pageantology. You know, my husband came up with that name actually. And we loved it and we ran with it. And we've been teaching girls and coaching girls together, teaching a workshop, a national workshop. Um, we became sponsors of the Miss Belize Universe pageant, um, coached Miss Albania last year for Miss Universe. We've co we coached um, Chesley to win Miss North Carolina USA and then Miss USA. So we have three clients of ours, three pageantology girls that won Miss USA, three others that won the title of Miss Teen USA. Um, first runner up to Miss America. I mean, dozens of, of state titles. So, you know, it works. The stuff that we have taught, the, the, work, the tools that work for us to win Miss USA, we're teaching them now to other young women. Um, and they're, it's working for them as well, not just in pageantry, but in life. Because I always teach my clients, I'm like, look, I still use these same tools, like these same things that I use to brand myself when I went to Miss USA um, to present myself. I use them all the time to book my next hosting job or, you know, when I'm at a meeting with a director or producers or whatever, you know, it's what do you get? Your meeting isn't, you're not going to have an hour long meeting with somebody. So what are you going to say in that short amount of time? That's really going to set you apart from everybody else that they're interviewing for the job. Right. And yeah. And, you know, the science behind the whole uh, method, I noticed that, you know, the current Miss USA and you, you both rock natural hair when you won. So the choice of, you know, presenting yourself with curly hair and mm -hmm. um, telling Miss USA the rock her natural, which I don't know. <laughs> do, but did, was that part of like the winning thing? Did you do that on purpose back in 2003? Because again, you were up against, you know, at the last, last, last two, you were against the stereotype of beauty that we say it's beautiful in the United States, which is a, a Caucasian woman who is blonde, blue eyed, and mm -hmm. you come with your curly hair and your beautiful Latina hair, and <laughs> you won. We were like, yes, <laughs> because that was such a big moment because again, like, you know, as a stylist, I know that I've, I've worked with clients where I have to change their perception of beauty because we're Lat Latinos, right? So we have African, we have indigenous, we have European. So our beauty is different, which many are trying to buy these days, just that far. Oh, out. yes. But, you know, this whole woman, the Tamuel voluptuous and the curly hair, did, did you do that on purpose? I sure did, yeah. I sure to heck did. I mean, there was big discussion in Massachusetts after I won Miss Massachusetts USA and I was getting ready for Miss USA. You know, one of the first things you have to do is submit your official headshot to the Miss Universe organization. And so I remember my director set up four different photo shoots. She chose her two favorite photographers in Massachusetts and she said, okay, like do two different photo shoots. You're going to do one with curly hair and one with straight hair with each photographer. And then let's see how what we like. And she was torn. She was like, oh my gosh, Susie, you look great with straight hair. You look great with curly hair. I love your curls. And ultimately, I made the decision to wear my hair curly because, because I was wanting to really highlight my culture, my heritage, and how huge of an impact that had on my life and who the woman I was, you know, and still am. You know, back then I was I was 23 when I competed at Miss USA, or 22, sorry. And you could win. I, ¿cómo? You could win Miss USA today. I mean, oh, thank you. Literally, I was thank like, you. You look. <laughs> <laughs> You're so sweet. Thank you. Um, you know, it was just one of those things that was when I started to think of okay, if my goal at Miss USA is to be truly authentic to who I am, 
I have to wear my hair curly, you know, but the discussion was that girls with curly hair, number one, you know, it was always a girl with straight hair with that beautiful, long, flowy pageant hair, right? And even if you had naturally curly hair, you know, when I went to Miss USA, there were girls, there were other girls that had natural hair like mine, but they didn't compete with it. All of them, even the, even the black girls straightened their hair, you know, and I was the only one that competed with my curly hair. So again, embracing my culture, embracing who I truly was is what helped me what set me apart from the rest of the pack. And um, I think, I think added to the sparkle, you know, that I had within me and that confidence because I knew I was being true to who I truly am. Yes, absolutely. And speaking of the, how amazing you are and all of the different things you do, you're an author. So confidence is queen. The four keys to ultimate beauty through positive thinking, which you mm-hmm. authored in 2007. Congratulations. That's amazing. Thank you. Did your experience and journey becoming the third Latina to win, you know, Miss USA inspires you to write this book? You know, ultimately, I think it did because um, I, one of the things you do a lot of when you become Miss USA is you do a lot of public speaking. And I did a ton of that. And, you know, afterwards I would do meet and greets with whoever was in the crowd, you know, and take pictures with people and stuff. And I can't tell you how many times I would always tell, always, always tell my mom's story and how I got from point A to point B, how I became, you know, this poor girl from the ghetto in Massachusetts. How did that girl like defeat the odds to become Miss USA, you know? And I would tell that story and tell my mom's story. And afterwards, inevitably, there were a bunch of single moms in the audience and they would come up to me crying, you know, really moved and touched that I, thanking me for sharing that story because, you know, their little girl was sitting next to them and they don't have a whole lot of money. And she's hearing Miss, the current Miss USA talk about how she was in the same, in her same shoes. And so it's really inspirational, you know, and oh my gosh, that really touched me. Um, And I realized how impactful the story could be and me sharing it. And then furthermore, when I got to MTV, when I, you know, I I hosted TRL and it was a live show every day. And when we would step foot on, onto the stage, you know, like five minutes before we were to go live or whatever, the kids in the teenagers, and they would yell out and, oh my God, Susie, I love you. They would tell me that they loved me. And I was like, that sat with me. And I was like, I have an opportunity here to use this fame that has come to me for good. You know, I could squander it and do nothing with it, or I can do more and try to inspire even more kids, right? Because I was super inspired as a kid by, you know, people like Jennifer Lopez. Oh my God, Jayla was like, and she ended up being one of my first um, interviews at on MTV, which was like, oh my gosh. Wow. But it was amazing. But, you know, she, I mean, you remember when, Jill, I mean, she still rocks the, the hoop, the giant hoop earrings. When I went to Miss USA, go back and watch, I'm wearing rhinestone hoop earrings because J-Lo wore hoop earrings. And I was like, I am turning up the Latina. I'm wearing my hair curly. I'm wearing hoop earrings. My dress had was Spanish lace inspired, the evening gown that I wore. I had ruffles on the bottom. I was like, festival. I'm like, let's go have a party at Miss USA and bring the Latin flavor. And so, you know, all of that was what inspired my book. And, uh, and I wrote it for, you know, for those little girls that the teenage girls at, at TRL that would scream out, I love you, Susie. You know, I would want that. I wanted them to know my story and I wanted it. I wanted them to be inspired by it in some way, shape or form. We continue to be inspired by you because, you know, now you're a Latina in Hollywood, you know, as an actress, we can find you on season five with Tyler Perry's hit sitcom, House of Pain. I know that you recently wrapped up, you know, a few uh, movies and you have also a feature film uh, with Disney's Underdog. How are you feeling about Latinos in Hollywood today? How are you feeling, you know, well represented? Are you feeling there's some things missing? How are you feeling? Yeah, you know what? We definitely have seen, um, we've seen movement forward movement, which is great, but am I happy with what is out there? No, you know, I think we could do a lot better. 
I think we can um, organize the same way that, you know, the African-American folks have organized in Hollywood and they are killing it. I think Latinos in Hollywood can definitely take a page out of their book and come together um, to do more and to demand more representation. You know, I think, you know, like I said, one day at a time on Netflix, they're doing really well, Hintified on Netflix. Um, you know, they just got picked up for a second season. I have a friend on the show, so I'm really happy that they're doing so well, but I still think there's so much more because so much more we can do because, you know, as an actress and seeing, seeing the auditions that come in, I can tell you that what it seems like is when somebody says, oh, we want this character to be diverse. It seems like it's diverse to them means black. (laughs) You know, so I'm like, wait a minute, you guys like there's Latinos, there's Asians, you know, there's natives like we can we can expand like diversity means a lot more than that. Um, So I think I, you know, I think it's getting better 100 percent, but I think it could be it's not where it needs to be. Yeah, I mean, the facts do show that Latinos are the least uh, represented minority across all media. And, you know, there are people like you said, that are doing the job, the work. Uh, John Mm -hmm. Leguizamo is doing an amazing job. Uh, You know, Hamilton, Le Manuel, amazing. And what he, all of the the work that he's putting in, everyone is doing amazing work, just like the two filmmakers that we have on today that I'm so, so proud of them for this insanely good documentary that is so, so necessary. Um, But we're definitely going to get to them because these are the kind of folks that, we all need to get to know, you know, because this is the wave of the future and I I cannot wait to get to them. But you also now are hosting. I know that you fell into hosting with, you know, fell, I was saying fell, but (laughs) TV, your first gig, you don't just fall into like, you know, MTV and TRL and all those wonderful things. I know that you get, you was a guest host on live with Beaches and Kelly. I mean, Mm -hmm. you are making your rounds and now with NASDAQ, Cultural Capital, which is such a great show. Tell us about Cultural Capital. Thank you. You know, the best way to um, to describe cultural, pa- cap- cultural Capital, it's kind of like, you know, everybody remembers MTV Cribs. Um, yeah. Everything revolves, goes back to MTV. MTV Cribs, right, where the celebrities would show you around their, their home and all the luxuries and everything that, that they have. Um, so this is basically MTV Cribs for the tech startup world. So we go, um, you know, our crew goes, we, we shoot these amazing tech companies. I always sit down with the CEO um, and we talk about their cultural capital. Like, what is it about this company? What is it about your employees? What you guys do here on a day-to-day basis that, um, you know, the things that you offer to your employees to get them to stay there and work as hard as they do to make your company super successful like that's what we're digging deep right and and the show is meant to be um you know just to highlight amazing entrepreneurs um incredible ceos uh that had a dream and just decided to go for it and here they are now you know about to potentially go public um you know with their company and it's it's meant to inspire the younger generation you know and what they can accomplish too what they can do as as young entrepreneurs yeah, yeah, I mean, young and old ones, because I <laughs> was... Yeah, absolutely. Obsessed. I was like, you know, and Susie and I spoke about this, how about the Latino community and the uh, Black community, you know, we don't have a strong financial uh, uh, growing up. We don't we don't grow up thinking about stocks and bonds. We don't grow up about uh, investing. We don't grow up, and none of that is actually, it's almost taboo to talk about salaries and talk about how much money you make and all this, how much is that? And, you know, and that is something that I know that Susie and I are going to partner up and create a way to give back in a nonprofit kind of way, because I know Susie, again, does a lot of philanthropic stuff. So, you know, with that, I love, love, love what I learned in Brazil. When you went to Brazil, Mercado Libre, that is an incredible, incredible job. just world. It's almost like a world that they have created. People live here. People shop there. Yeah. It's amazing. So 
I, I absolutely love it. I love that you are traveling the world and educating us on everything that we need to get educated on because it's amazing. And so now we're going to take a three minute break because then we're going to come back with you, Susie, and we're going to come back with our two filmmakers and we're going to talk about Puerto Rico because this is going to be incredible, you guys. But again, we're going to take a three minute break and then show you the trailer of the documentary, Maria Se Fue, all right? So tech, take the next three minutes. You're going to refill your cocktail while you have your phone with you. You are going to get it together, but next we'll be talking with the team of brothers behind the lens. So we'll see you in three minutes. Have you ever asked the question, if I was to be anything, what would I be? Regardless of money, regardless of status, beyond popularity and fame, living your passion, feeling your life has purpose. Solivity is a space to nurture that which lives in all of us. A place where work can become play and doing what we love creates the dreams of a lifetime. Hey everybody, I'm Francesca Maxime and want to really invite you into a new conversation, which might feel a little bit uncomfortable to start, Inside Out with Natasha and Francesca, unpacking racism. Where did we get these ideas? Why are we in this white body supremacist society? What is it to be an embodied anti-racist? I'm with Dr. Natasha Stovall. Natasha, explain what you see in your therapy sessions and why you want to do this show. I want to do this show, Francesca, because so many white people in my practice are asking, why is it that the world that we live in is so racist, but I don't feel racist? I'm not a racist. And even though I think that's a very sincere question, I think all white people now need to begin from a place of the world that we create is racist, whether we mean it to be or not. So how do we understand and start to change the ways that we have learned, whether it's something we're aware of learning, if anyone who taught us was aware that that's what they were teaching us, how can we help them stop practicing racism even when they don't feel racist? That's so that's right. where we're starting from and we're gonna go from there. And yeah, it's gonna be uncomfortable, but that's what therapy is all about and that's what therapists are good at. All right, Natasha, thank you. And everybody who wants to tune in, it's pretty much a show that's going to be about white-bodied folks and inquiries there, and certainly we'll be taking your questions, but anybody can tune in. It's going to be on Facebook Live Wednesdays at noon. We'll look forward to seeing you. Because you are accustomed to a way of life, and it's no longer that way of life is there. Simplemente en septiembre fueron muchos meses que estuvimos sin energía eléctrica, sin agua potable, mucho sin techo y hoy en día podemos decir que sobrevivimos a María. On September 20th, 2017, a Category 4 hurricane came and devastated the island of Puerto Rico. But it's when María left, the people felt abandoned. The storm's heavy rain, violent winds, catastrophic flooding, and landslides shattered the island's infrastructure and further weakened this economy. It was the worst recorded natural disaster for this region and America's worst blackout, lasting many months. It sparked the largest immigration from the island since 1950 and further contributed to the closure of 265 schools. The distribution of aid was inadequate and chaotic, leaving some American citizens living in barely a skeleton of what was once their home for generations. When the government was exposed for covering up supplies left to rot in containers, for embezzling funds meant for reconstruction, and for ridiculing the people it swore to serve, up to one million fed up Puerto Ricans took to the streets of San Juan to overthrow the government. Oh, 
I can think of at least 4,645 reasons why we can't let what happened with Hurricane Maria be lost in history. The lives lost rival the collapse of the World Trade Center and Hurricane Katrina combined. This is why the story needs to be told, but it's not my story to tell. I put my business on hold in New York and with my brother traveled to all 78 pueblos, including places the media, aid, and outside recovery simply never came. These are the voices of local Boricuas who responded and survived. We heard their strength, their courageousness, and their orgullo. Las ganas de echar pa'lante. Directly from the true heroes of the island, the Boricuas who are raising Puerto Rico back up by its roots. Este golpe de María este, nos unió. ¿Por qué? El Boricua no se cae. Welcome back, guys. Welcome back. And again, say hello to Leonardo Claudio and Kenneth Dumang, who are here with us today to talk about Maria Se Fue. Hi, guys. How are you? Good, good. Kenneth, you're uh, on mute. Let's unmute Kenneth, please. Um, Leo, how are you, brother? How's it going? I'm doing well. I'm here in Puerto Rico, nice and warm. How are you? Thank you for the opportunity for allowing us to speak on your on your platform. Absolutely, it's my honor. It's my pleasure to have you both here, um, Kenneth. I know you're here. You're here in the states, Kenneth, or are you in Puerto Rico as well? No, I'm back in the states for a little while right now. Yes. Okay. Cool. Cool. So everyone saw the trailer, and I know I'm going to get the comments and I'm going to get the phone calls because this is. This is history. We're making history here in bringing such an amazing, amazing documentary to us. So let's talk about life after Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, which, you know, again, I saw, I, I thank you guys for sending over the, the whole documentary to me because, whew, like I'm just saying, like being raised in Puerto Rico and, you know, understanding, I know that Susie, we had spoken and how she contributed to the, to getting uh, people back into, you know, the, what we can do, you know? So I want you, I want to first, I know you two are brothers. So I want to take it back to who are you guys? Who are you guys? What are you doing? Talk to me. Uh, Len, you want to start? Okay, I'll start. Um, I'm Leonardo Claudio, so I, I have uh, Leo Graphic Photography and Studios. I originally am a professional photographer, then turned uh, cinematographer just off of what seems like a calling and necessity. Uh, Kenny and I, Kenny are our brothers. Kenny's the older brother. Um, and and yeah, that's that's basically... That's us and that's me in a nutshell. I, to give you guys a little bit more background on my photography, I'm a professional concert photographer. That's where I, that's why I specialize in. We've worked, I've worked for publications that, and we cover anywhere between local uh, artists to professional, to celebrities as well. Um, I've moved on from then, from that to, to do a lot more work in Puerto Rico primarily the documentary, and now we're working on uh, local artists here while we are uh, on smaller projects until we until we fully unroll the, uh, the documentary. That's incredible. And, and Kenneth, did you guys grow up in Brooklyn or where was it you guys grew up? Definitely in Brooklyn. We have 16 years apart though, so don't tell anybody because I look like my <laughs> brother, I know. Wow, I thought you was older. You know? <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's that that's the gap, you know, that's the gap that we have. Um and basically I I'm I'm kind of like a real artsy person, you know, when it comes to either music or regular art, acting, whatever it is, you know. I just have like a ear and an eye for that kind of stuff, you know. My yeah. brother my brother is a very talented kid and uh, I try to install like my vision, you know, and he was born with a vision too. So it kind of developed 
uh, you know, like we kind of like developed everything together. We, we can say like at an early age. And then when he went off to college, you know, he, he uh, learned all the tricks of the trades and everything and, and, and bring and bring it back home. And um, we weren't together for about probably, probably eight years. Ooh. Yeah, between eight, about, about between eight to ten years. years. About eight to ten years. I right. left. I left for college at sixteen. Mm-hmm. I went to right. I went to St. Lawrence University, upstate New York. Um, as I was turning seventeen, I started. I started a year early, and since then, I didn't really live in New York. Mm-hmm. I would come back and forth um, for a couple for for a week at most, a couple a, week, a right. couple weeks at most. I w- I would always see Kenny. Um, Kenny left. Uh, the house early too, because he had he had a sire, my nephew, his son. So we we were always in contact, but we didn't live with each other. And then eight years after that, we reconvened in Puerto Rico for to first off to take care of my father who was terminally ill, and then to uh, to do this project. We just it was it was right. really a, a, on a whim that we kind of created this project. Right, right. You know that you were here, you were in the States, uh, Leo, and then you left everything and you went to go meet him in Puerto Rico. What what was the driving force behind that? Like how what what made you do that? <laughs> so I think the <laughs> the, ma- the major thing was I was a I was a bank manager at the time and when Hurricane Maria hit, me and my brother, I was trying to get in contact with my father, who was who was very ill. And we just couldn't, we couldn't get in contact with him. And the, the few times he was able to get in contact with us, I would miss it because I was at work. And so we went over to Puerto Rico as soon as we could, my, bro- my brother and I, and we saw Puerto Rico in not a great state. And then we, then we returned and then, ke- then I went back to take care of my father about eight months after, after the hurricane. For about two years, for for about two months, taking him to hospitals, driving through the barrios, um, the highways, and just seeing this this isn't right, you know. Like for for the amount of media attention that we had for a while, and then nothing. So in our mind, we're like, okay, Puerto Rico should be a lot better. They're not covering the catastrophe of Hurricane Maria anymore. Um, Puerto Rico doesn't need help. And when we when we returned and, and when I was there seeing my take care of my father firsthand, so no, like Puerto Rico deserves more attention. We're not out of it yet, and that story need, that story needs to be told. So at that point, it was going to be a photo story. I was just going to travel to as many um, to as many pueblos as possible, to seven eight municipalities, to take photos and document it that way. Because originally, with my photography. I was, um, I used to work with the New York Amsterdam News as a photojournalist. Uh, and then we, I started doing some video work and then we went, we saw there's a bigger story. We could tell the story with a more powerful if, message through people. If they, if they told it, right. If they told it. Mm-hmm. And I as you guys. That was what, that was, that was one of the things that I was most impressed about because that's the piece of the puzzle that we're missing. Mm-hmm. We know what the government lies says. We know what the United States is saying, throwing bounty rolls at us. Yes. We know, we know, we know so much from different entities, but the people that actually went through it. If you didn't go to Puerto Rico yourself, you would never think so because then you saw these beautiful pictures of beaches and like we were back to normal and I'm like still talking to friends and family in the center who are like we don't have any light we don't have right. any water we don't have exactly. just a like, roof ah. we still don't have a roof you know there's still many places without roofs yeah wow. over 30,000 homes where are you guys from from Aguadilla I was born in I was born in Aguadilla that's why I went back I went back home to to basically be with my family because when uh, little, I moved over here with just my mother, so no family. Until Lenny was born, I didn't have family in, in, in New York, so that's crazy, right? Wow, look at that. Yeah. But um, I think I think uh, we just took advantage of a bad situation, you know? Absolutely. And not, 
And did you guys, how was it when you were actually filming? Like, were you guys, what, El Pueblo, did they open their arms to you and said, yes, please tell our stories? Or did you have a little back and forth with some folks? How did no, that No, nothing like that. Uh, actually, we had only a couple of contacts for like a couple of interviews. Everything else was, they plugged us to the next person and so forth and so on, you know? And we went through the whole island like that. We went through the whole island of word of mouth and, and just basically one person connecting us to the next person, you know? And it just so happens, like, uh, we started off with, with, with regular, not to say re but regular people. Um, and then they had connects to, like, nonprofit organizations and all. So we just, it was, like, very godly, very spiritual. Um, we went with total faith. Uh, and then we watched what we wanted, what we wanted to do we watched it manifest into something else, mm -hmm. which was way more powerful. It, it was a back, it, it was a hidden story within the story. And it was the triumph of the people's attitude, you know, and the bounce back that they showed after the tragedy. And which is such an important thing, you know, we, we, I think as Boricuas, we're, um, we were like the protocol of what the world was going to be before anybody knew about it, you understand? Uh, we were the first ones to be colonized from, from uh, America. Uh, so we were indigenous, black, and European before anybody was. And uh, because of that, we, if, if, if you read up on our history, they've been testing on us. They've been, I mean, we went through everything, you know? So this hurricane and the way they treated us afterwards wasn't a surprise to me. Wasn't a surprise to me, you know? The surprise was, the attitude that came back out, you know? So now I, I'm, I'm always in Puerto Rico every year. Um, I'm proud to say that after Hurricane Maria, our culture is back. Our culture is back 100% now with the art, with the food, you know, with the tourist, with uh, the mom and pop um, shops and everything. And, 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 you know, I'm super proud, super proud. It should be. And I told, I texted Leo when I was watching it and I was just like, maybe not even a quarter past the documentary. And of course my eyes were like this big. <laughs> but, uh, I told him that one thing that I know for sure is that this documentary is going to reignite the love that Puerto Ricanos have. Right. That to me is, you know, we're so proud, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Latinos in general, we're really, really, really proud of our, so much that we say the country or the island that we're from versus I'm from South America or I'm from Central America. We are, I am Colombiano. I am Venezolano. I am mm -hmm. Puerto Rico. I am Cubano. You know, we're so, so proud. But I lo digo, and I guess because I'm, you know, I was raised in Puerto Rico and uh, with an immigrant mother, the only Colombian woman in I Bonito Puerto Rico mm -hmm. at the time. And the work, the people, the people, the people. I got to say, you know, yes, the entertainment industry, the Ricky Martin of the world, Jennifer Lopez, as we mentioned, you know, millions of dollars, you know, going to the island. Everybody, you know, I did a, a Christmas uh, a toy drive for the children of my hometown because I n understand what it is to have Las Navidades Puertorriqueñas with, you know, or Reyes Magos, you know, with the trail of the grass, the whole thing. And I know that's magic, you know? Yes, yes. I do not want our babies to not have a Christmas because of Hurricane Maria, right? And so it went from an idea just to like, you know, not as big as you guys is because that tells me, you know, there are no mistakes. You guys went in with this idea and all of a sudden the real purpose right. grew. And that is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing to see. What I want to know next is where are we going to get to see this? What are the film festivals that are calling? I'm going to start making phone calls on my end because you guys need to be everywhere. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so, how, how where do we see you? And, and, and talk talk to us about the film festivals that you guys are going to be featured at. Okay, definitely. So you, so as of right now, we're actually on social media, Maria Sefue Doc. Um, we're posting. 
uh, the, the portraits I've taken from every interview with an excerpt of each of each interview. So you're getting you're getting a little bit of a of a tidbit of something that might not even be in the documentary. So you're getting something more behind the scenes and like some really really important information that just couldn't make it in because we did what over 80 interviews to a lot of film to get it into an hour and a half <laughs> less than an hour and a half because we're battling with people's attention span. But um but so what we're doing now, we're actually we're gonna host a private uh, premiere virtually because of COVID, there's uh, gathering restrictions. So be on the lookout for that on, on social media. We're, we're giving more information about that. And then the film festival. So we're still, we're still moving forward. We're not letting COVID-19 stop us. We're, um, the, first, the first film festival that we submitted into is the International Puerto Rican Heritage Film Festival in Lower East Side. Um, we also, you'll see it in Sundance. We're submitting it into Sundance. And there's a Miami one. There's one in Miami for Latin uh, filmmakers that we're putting in there as well. So those are the confirmed ones. And we'll let, we'll let you guys know on social media what other ones we're, we're submitting into. Yeah, I know I'm going to be at the Lower East Side one because I live at the Lower East Side. So Good. we'll see you soon. Then. Yes. Hi, I need a hookup, a brother hookup. <laughs> um, yeah. What do you guys want to accomplish, both of you? And I want to hear from both of you on this one. What are you hoping to accomplish with the release of this film? Mm. You want me to go or you go first? I'll let, I'll let you go first, Ken. Uh, I'm, I'm big on uh, preparation, you know? I think like what we went through, what, what what we just went through over there, we can definitely repeat. And I think you know, just just having uh something that 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 they can see that can help them prepare. God forbid we get hit with another hurricane like that, you know. Absolutely, and you, Leo. Uh, there's there's two things. So, for what well, what we hope to do with this film, first and foremost. Um, just like the International Puerto Rican Film Festival did for me, was anybody who has an idea, who has a camera, but is too scared to take action or analysis paralysis, where you just keep thinking about how you're going to get something done and you don't do it, just go out there and do it. Like Kenny said, we started off with a couple connections and I flew to the island on a one-way ticket. I said, we're going to figure this out. And we yeah. did. And now we have a final product. And the second thing is, is I would I would die happy if Boricuas on the island when they when they watch this and Bori, and Boricuas in the diaspora, they feel represented. They feel that they have a voice because there have been other films on Netflix. I'm not going to say which name that totally butchered what Puerto Ricans went through, and it wasn't and it wasn't a story told by Puerto Ricans. This story, I speak a couple times, but aside from that, it's all the interviews. It's as many interviews as we put in of them telling exactly what they went through. So it, it was a way for, like I said before, Boricuas to get their voice heard. Power to the people. Really, exactly. Power to the people, baby. Right. Power to the people is right. So guys, I want to thank you so much. Again, to everybody out there, Maria Sefue is a documentary about the life after Hurricane Maria on the island of Puerto Rico, these two amazing filmmakers traveled through 78 pueblos to create a platform for the local Boricuas to tell their story and how they survived the Category 4 storm of September in 2017. The people of Puerto Rico, they paint the realistic picture. There's no lies. This is what it is. And they're going to also explain to us their road to recovery and Leonardo and Kenneth, I want to say gracias hermanos. Thank you so much for taking the initiative to do this, to commit yourselves, you know, blessings to your father. And I hope that, you know, these last uh, few months that you have with them, you know, because I understand what's going on that, you know, we all just, just give them tons and tons of love. I don't know this man, but he created both of you. And that already for me is a win-win situation. So thank you. Thank you so, so much. Miss Susie Castillo, mi amor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
we actually have to do another round of interviews with both of with all three of you guys because <laughs> obviously an hour was just not enough um but again Muchas gracias, mi gente, and I Thank will you. be in touch with all of you soon. And just before we leave, please share. We'll start with Susie, ladies first. We'll start uh, with your social media handles. I want people to follow you. If uh, there's a little primita who wants to be Miss USA one day, they know they can look to Susie. If you need a filmmaker, photographer, anything, you guys have Kenneth and Leo. So Susie, por favor your uh, social media handle. Of course, thank you so much for having me, Javier. This is such a pleasure and to introduce me to these amazing Puerto Ricanos who are- thank you. I mean, likewise. I, guys, I cannot wait to watch this documentary. I can't wait to support you guys on all social media. Um, speaking of which, my social media is, my handle on, on Instagram is Susie Castillo. It's just my name. Um, at Suzy Castillo, but I will be blowing you guys up when and and sending you congrats on every film festival you make. And who knows if I have a film at one of them, we'll see each other. We'll meet each other at the film festival. That'd be amazing. I mean, hello, <laughs> hello. We'll have to do this again, like preparing yeah, the road to the film festival. Exactly. Uh, social media handles. Uh, mine is Leo Graphic, so that's the the company's L E O G R A P H I C, and then the documentary is Maria Se Fue Doc, all awesome. all together. Awesome, awesome. All right, guys, muchas gracias. Thank you so much, and we will see each other soon. All right. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. We are now, uh, you know, due to our little technical. Difficulties. Our CO3 celebrity guest, Jesus Aponte, can't be with us, but listen, he's going to be here next Thursday. I promise you guys that. I promised you guys a salsa class with a two time world champion. I promise you he will be here and I'll give him 20 minutes. <laughs> How about that? Because, you know, technology is technology. What are you going to do? But again, I want to thank you, all of you, Susie Castillo, Leonardo Claudio, Kenneth Dumang, Jesus, even though we didn't see your face, you were with us and you'll still be with us. And again, thank you, thank you, all of you. And remember, guys, stay curious, be gorgeous, y amable. Okay? Gracias. Ciao. Thank you for watching Conciencias Con Cocktails with Javier Pedrosa right here on Solivity TV every Thursday at 6 p.m. Solivity Magazine brings you the best in inspiration on Solivity TV. Check out our new shows. Mark your calendars for Solivity Magazine shows by going to solivity.com now.